Coming back uh, to the states and the way that um, uh, our government uh, addressed it, I mean, how would you characterize this? Um, and, and, and when we look at the players, um, Geithner and, uh, and, and, and Paulson to a certain extent, um, uh, what, what, where on the spectrum are, are they even involved in? Like how much of those pre-existing narratives are they uh, deploying or is, is their response less ideological and just more completely transactional based upon, for lack of a better word, like who their friends were? Hi, this is a, this is a great question. I mean, who their friends were really matters. Uh, and the fact that they were or at least colleagues, if not friends really makes the American situation unique, I think, in the incredibly kind of tight-knit community that was built from the 90s onwards. It really, I think, starts under the Clinton administration. That's at least when it becomes bipartisan. Uh, the network that connects Washington, uh, the Treasury, to the New York Fed and Wall Street just becomes so close. So the, the men assembled in that room, Sheila Bear is the only woman who is present on the 13th of October 2008, are all... You know, even though Hank Paulson is sitting across the desk, on the other side of the desk, he's the ex-colleague of the former CEO of Goldman Sachs, of the banker sitting on the other side of the table. Um, and when Geithner is appointed Treasury Secretary, you know, it has become such a standing assumption that the Treasury Secretary is an ex-Goldman Sachs man um, that everyone imagines that he is, even though, in fact, he's a career public servant up to that point. So those social, those social networks play play a key role Um I think the other thing which they mobilize are narratives of, of, of action, of executive power, of emergency management, which, in fact, in the American case, are heavily indebted to the America's military experience of recent decades, something that marks America as quite different from Europe. You don't see a lot of German crisis fighters talking about, you know, the Powell Doctrine, which is derived from, you know, the Vietnam War and its aftermath. So not, a lot, not a lot of clouds of Ipsians in the German finance ministry, let's put it that way, in the way that there are on the American side. But I do think ideology plays a role as well. I mean, if you listen to people like Guy and it's quite clear that options like nationalizing a, a major American bank, above and beyond what they did anyway with taking a government stake by way of TARP in all of the banks, the idea of breaking up Citigroup, for instance, and resolving it with perhaps temporary government ownership, what was called the Swedish option uh, in 2009, that was really a long way from anything that he ever wanted to take seriously and consider. And this was fully endorsed by Barack Obama as well. I mean, Barack Obama is a, absolutely a centrist on these kind of issues. Um, gives a very revealing interview in 2009 where he says, you know, that's just not something we're going to do. We understand that it worked well in Sweden. They had a banking crisis. They nationalized all their banks, restructured, and then privatized them again. We're just not going to do that here. That's not the way. That's not the American way. So there is a. I think there are there are really deeply entrenched uh, ideological lines which which shape this, despite the pragmatism and the social networks and so on that are that are also also shaping the crisis response. Uh, we we spoke to uh, David Dayan, a um, uh, writer who I think cited you actually in his uh, his writing about uh, Geithner over the past uh, week or so as people revisit uh, that yeah. time. And yeah. I can't quite remember the quote, uh, but it had something to do with Geithner basically just um, swimming in certain waters. Um, it, it was it, that it was almost, you know, it was preordained. And it, this had to do with Geithner, I guess, refusing to... Um, uh, even provide for Obama the requested uh, game plan if they were to take that Swedish option. Yes, exactly. I mean, and Geithner has contested this. Uh, all of this goes back to Suskin's book about the Obama administration, which was very hotly contested by the Obama administration itself. It, it was damaging to them politically when it came out. And Obama, Geithner went on the record to flatly deny uh, that he did slow walk the Citigroup proposal. So, in fairness to him, one should one should put that on the record that he that he refuses this uh, this narrative. But it is it is uh, uh, attested by several people that in the crucial meeting in the spring of 2009, the resolution of the meeting was that a plan, a game plan for the resolution of Citigroup was to be prepared, and this is what the president ordered, and it never happened. Um, and what instead happened was the stress testing system. 
um, which uh, Geithner preferred as the model to, to do this. Um, there's no doubt that, you know, the C- city group Nexus that was organized around Robert Rubin was, was key to, to how in the entire Obama um, economics team was recruited. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very dense network that revolves around Rubin. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the emails that, that on which the short lists of candidates for Obama cabinet positions were compiled came out of Citigroup email servers. So, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's an undeniable sociology, uh, to this, to this network. Right. And one has to say it's highly functional. I mean, compared to what we see in Europe, the ability of the American elite for better or worse, to coordinate its action at this moment is decisive in producing the coherent, comprehensive solution that emerges, obviously at considerable political cost because not enough was done, if you like, to offset the quite legitimate impression that there was basically a kind of oligarchic cabal running the show, um, but, which, you know, it's not a, this is a first approximation. It's not a bad description of what was happening. Now, I mean, this is what this is the, the sort of the fascinating and sort of the, the, the scary um, um, one of the scary parts about this is that uh, from a technocratic perspective, um, they solved the crisis. Um, they yep. they made political choices as to who would pay the cost of it in the long run. And you yep. talk about a political cost. But at the end of the day, it is a political cost in the same way their relationship to this political cost is almost identical to my relationship to the New England Patriots losing last weekend. I'm super bummed about it. They're my team. But at the end of the day, it doesn't impact me at all. Right? Like, yeah. right? Like all of these people, the political cost for them with Donald Trump is their taxes got cut. I mean, so their their banking uh, uh, regulations got relaxed. There has been no cost for their decisions. It is a perfect model, it seems to me, of privatizing the profits and socializing the cost. And the political cost, it's unclear to me because none of these people have paid really any price the democrats theoretically right uh maybe hillary clinton maybe some of these people would have had jobs but there doesn't seem to be a cost that is borne by anyone within that social world that circle i mean i i see you i I take your point that it's kind of you know heads heads uh heads i win uh tails you lose um from the point of view of, uh, from the point of view of the narrow domain of banking regulation and so on, um, but I'm talking about like ninety percent of the people in this country, right? I mean, we're I mean, like the the decisions that they could have made at any juncture, where we're going yeah. to bail out the homeowners, where we are going to yeah. break up the big banks so that you know there is no yeah. future systemic risk. The, all of these costs were born by the vast majority of Americans. I mean, and I imagine also we could see a similar story in Europe, although it's complicated by, uh, you know, sort of the, uh, the, the competence question and and their ability to, to act, you know, uh, uh, efficiently. But it seems to me all the court cost has been borne by actually like everyone else. Like, yeah, I mean, and I don't, I don't want to be pushed into the position of like defending the record of the Obama administration, but I mean, the answer that they would give, the answer, though, you know, somebody like Geiner will give is that the ta- American taxpayer makes a profit on the bailouts. So the crisis itself is a huge shock to the American economy, and that's where the cost is. The crisis itself is a disaster for millions of people who lose their homes, who suffer unemployment. That's where the cost is. Um, the response of the government in the end paid for itself. And in terms of fixing structural problems in the US, in the US, in US society, the Obama administration took the considered decision that healthcare was the priority. Um, this was the this was the policy that would touch all Americans, especially lower income Americans, and that was their political priority. And given the limited political capital they had, they were going to do stimulus first and foremost, which they did right from you know from the word go. As soon as Obama's elected, they're working on that, and then their next priority is healthcare. 
and everything else is secondary to that. They do the political arithmetic on the on other options, including doing homeowner bailouts, and just decide that the arithmetic is not good enough to make it worth making a big push on this side. So it's going to be macroeconomic policy, a bailout which pays for itself, and healthcare, and those are going to be the three strands. Now, I mean, I've, <laughs> right, that's, I think, the best case you can make for the Obama administration, and that is the case that they will try and make. And obviously, you're absolutely right that the 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 the, the what costs remain um, are indeed burdened on the, the you know the hugely disadvantaged minority they hit by the immediate force of the shock and above all it's the minority communities of the United States right that suffer the, the hit because it's their wealth such as it is that's invested above all in real estate and the Latino and African American communities of the United States suffer losses to their median household wealth that they will probably you know will never recover from in in any real meaningful sense right that money is never coming back and over generations we will talk about uh, entire communities which are much poorer uh, than they were in 2007 so you no know, those shocks those th that damage is real um and of course we have all the ongoing effects of global change in this economic structure which impact blue collar relatively less educated americans severely and continue to impact them severely and whilst government is doing this crisis fighting it can't be minding the store on other issues and so you have terrible cuts to education which is presumably the bedrock of any public response um, across many of the states of the united states because as much fiscal give as the federal government is doing it's being taken away at the state level in many many cases so I agree with you, but the the defense the Obama administration would make is is you know in the in those terms. Okay, and, and fair enough, and um, and um, I uh, I appreciate your, uh, your you know your your holding their brief to a certain extent. Uh, let me just ask you one more question about that, and then I just want to I just want to just sort of uh, go up to where we are in present day. Um, yeah. uh, the 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 reported story that Barney Frank tells about uh, Paulson saying all we need, this is when he was president-elect, all we need is President Obama, President-elect Obama, to sign off on bailing out the homeowners as a, the path in which to inject these funds, uh, as opposed to going to the banks and hoping the banks then do principal reductions. Uh, reportedly, Barney Frank says that uh, he went to Obama and wanted Obama's sign-off, and Obama's response is, we only have one president at a time. Uh, type of thing. What? Wh how does that fit into that to that narrative? Well, I think all around um, TARP, there are a whole series of of um, uh, negotiations going on. I mean, TARP itself, which ultimately was used to recapitalize the banks, was sold the second time round to Congress as a measure that would provide substantial relief to homeowners. Um, and then, of course, virtually none of the TARP funds were used uh, for relief for homeowners. So there is an incredible amount of political jostling going on in those panic-stricken months in 2008 um, with uh, different parties quite clearly, I think, aware of the, of, the, of, the political, of the political costs of different options. Uh, no one overly anxious to carry the can of responsibility uh, until they absolutely have to. Um, and and so that kind of that kind of political game seems to me to to ring true um, uh, as a as a description of what's going on in that in that fall in in, in those four months. Okay, and so all right, so let's jump forward uh, ten years later. Um, what uh, what's the outlook? I mean, because that that's the part that that sort of scares me is that I think all those people involved in that crisis are convinced that what they did was not only uh, successful in salvaging the economy, but the only choice that they could have made, as opposed to a menu of other choices that could have been effective, but would have helped a different, would, would, have, would have, you know, helped the horse Help instead of the cart, yeah. as it were, or, 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 or however you want to sort of envision that, the, helped uh, the, the broad mass of people and allow their success to buoy the banks versus, you know, the, 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 the success of the banks to sort of somehow catch up ultimately with the rest of the people. 
Well, I mean, I think that, that with regard to the diagnosis of the crisis itself, I mean, Ben Bernanke and Paulson and Geithner have all been very much on the record in the last couple of weeks restating their side of the story. And it's difficult, I think, to argue with Ben Bernanke's latest report he did for Brookings. Uh, you know, we'll use a medical analogy here. It's as though a very, very bad case of the flu was overlaid by a heart attack. And what happened in 2007 was there's an extremely bad case of the flu. Um, obviously, this doesn't make any sense in medical terms, but was then, uh, then triggered a heart attack. And once the heart attack hits, once uh, your cardiovascular system starts shutting down, there really isn't any alternative to the kind of measures that were taken in 08. You have to recapitalize. You have to do liquidity provision on a huge scale. You probably have to do asset purchases. There isn't, you know, one could argue around the edges about maybe using some more comprehensive bankruptcy provision uh, over the summer of 2008 to just catch a lot of the pieces as they were falling and allow more of them to fall, perhaps even. Um, so as to impose some of the losses where they really belong on the on the banks and their shareholders. Um, but nevertheless, once that heart attack phase end starts up, um, you know, you, you really have to do those things because otherwise the show is just going to stop. So the the argument then is really how does the element of the flu, how does the element of the business cycle that is to do with the real estate boom and the real estate bust, how do we address those problems as well, that pain? Uh, that that those losses and to my mind the, the simple sing, the single most important and most equitable response is massive fiscal policy you know homeowner relief is problematic because basically what you're doing is bailing out all sorts of people who've taken on loans which they probably shouldn't have taken on and as we know in the really hot spots of the united states a lot of this was actually speculative and this isn't the hard luck stories this is the stories of middle class americans deciding they want to go into a little bit of real estate speculation and that happened on a very large scale in the hot spots of the u.s that isn't necessarily where you want to target relief but fiscal policy of an adequate scale, a $2 trillion stimulus rather than a $750 billion stimulus, seems to me to be the way in which one should think about addressing these problems across the board. And that's simply a matter of politics. Can you get a $2 trillion stimulus through Congress? And the chances of doing that now are much slimmer than they were of course, uh, in 2008. I just have Nine. to. I just have to push back on just uh, on that one premise that it was that the um, uh, the bulk of this was it, it, it and, and certainly in hot spots. Was, in hot spots. So in you're talking Florida. In hot spots, in, in it really is. In places like Arizona, the 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 percentage of second and third mortgages is enormous. In 2007. Right. I, I uh, uh, agreed. But when we're talking about, you know, uh, 1.5 million uh, foreclosures or, or 1.2. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, certainly um, giving relief to those people, we're just stopping widespread suffering. Right. I mean, exactly. And, 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 and there's various ways of doing this short of giving relief. You can stay the You can stay the foreclosure procedures. There's, there's of course, a, a wide variety right. of techniques that can be used to stabilize this. But in more posit- in a more positive vein, all of those are difficult to argue. They're extremely technical. They're complex. And they are, in a sense, you know, fighting the symptoms. You're fighting the distress. Um, whereas if the main problem is that the, if the, if the, that the national economy is entering a recession, right. which Fair will repress house prices for years on end, then a big classic stimulus measure seems to me to be much more promising. Right. And, and it's not an either or situation, we should say. No, at that point. ideally you'd want to do both. Absolutely. Ideally you'd want to do both. Okay. So lastly, how precarious is our situation now? I mean, uh, we have seen sort of like the slow degradation of Dodd-Frank almost, um, analogous to what we're seeing with the Affordable Care Act, which, in yeah. my estimation, makes a pretty good argument for taking a meat cleaver to these things rather than trying to perform surgery, uh, where you you simply um, restructure the way that these things um, are, are regulated or designed so that you can't unwind it as easily as it's been unwound by two years of of Trump and a uh, and a Republican Congress, but what wh- how where are we in terms of the next crisis? Well, we're clearly heading in the wrong direction, um, but I think it's important to distinguish, you know, crises and crises. Two thousand and eight was a uniquely severe shock. We've not seen anything like that before in history. Full stop. Um, and so, you know, I'm not expecting a repetition of something like that. 
certainly not with the same structure, which really was fundamentally transatlantic, European and American at the same time. We're not, we're not I don't think, at risk of anything like that, apart from anything else, because the European economy is so lame. Um, where we could see some risks uh, of uh, an analogous type would be in America's relationship with the emerging markets. But that's a very complex sort of futuristic scenario that's only really beginning to unfold. But in the meantime, you know, we, one can't disagree. I mean, the, the, the evisceration of, of Dodd-Frank um, is, is, is terrible for the stability and, uh, uh, of the American financial system in the long run because troublesome as that system was and uh, perhaps overly bureaucratic for the smaller banks, um, it nevertheless provided, you know, really the, the only uh, major and significant changes that came out of the crisis were driven by Dodd-Frank and co- in combination with Basel III, Basel IV. For the big banks, what matters, of course, is the combination of both the national regulations and the global regulations put in, put in place after the crisis. And those were designed from the start, above all by Geithner, to allow maximum discretion to the regulators. And that was a political gamble. It was a gamble that the Democrats would remain, or people like them would remain in charge of the in charge of the show. And as they lost political power, that opened the door to precisely what we're seeing now, this gradual erosion. And as you were saying early on, it's kind of a, it's a win-win situation uh, from the point of view of kind of elite establishment uh, Wall Street types who might very well have preferred Clinton as president, but now find that the profit making is a little bit easier. Adam Tooze, uh, the book is Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crises Changed the World. We will put a link to it at uh, majorityreportradio.com. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And thank you for having me on. All right, folks. Going to head to the fun half. I should tell you, this is a massive book. It's 500, uh, five, oh, it's almost 600 pages. I'm going to take that. What's that? I'm going to take it. You're going to take this? I think so, yeah. Convert the whole thing into audio? Take screenshots of it with my iPhone. And uh, scan it, then put it into PDF uh, form? No, I'm probably going to get the audio ball of that one. I, I had the Deluge by him before, so I was excited. Was it good? We had a yeah, very good. World War One era.